determination, curiosity, and perception. Hi, everyone. This is Heather Vickery, and you've tuned in to the Brave Files podcast. I am so happy to have you here with me, Brave One. Happy New Year. It's hard to believe we're here already. Just a couple of more days in this year. And I don't know about you, but for me, it seems like so much has happened and also like nothing has happened. Like we've been in some sort of incredible time warp for the last couple of years. Now, that isn't to say that I didn't create anything this year. There was, in fact, a lot of magic created. I finally, after a year's worth of hard work, published with my friend, client, client friend, Rachel Swanson, our Create Brave card deck. I wrote, edited, published, and released my brand new best-selling book, Fuck Fearless, Making the Brave Leap. You can actually get the books and the Create Brave cards via my website, vickeryandco.com. If you want to check those out, I would love to have you do that. We do have the cards in hand right now. It's so exciting. We waited so long for production on those. Woo. And I released a second podcast called Was It Chance? Have you checked it out yet? Wherever you're listening to this podcast, you can listen to that one. So yes, it's been a busy, fun, exciting, creative year. And yet I just kind of feel, you know, like I was sort of in a time warp. Did it happen? Did it not happen? I don't know. That's why I'm really excited for my word of the year for 2022, which is create. So I don't necessarily mean create like the things I just mentioned, but what do I want to create? I'm going to create peacefulness and joy and happiness and success, wealth of all kinds, abundance, just a lot of love and joy for myself, for my family, for my friends, community, clients, because I deeply believe that the more we can help other people be abundant and wealthy, then we will ourselves be abundant and wealthy in all of the different ways. So I would love to connect with you. Head on over to vickeryandco.com slash brave on purpose to join my free Facebook group. We can be friends there and hang out. And if there's ever any way I can support you, just reach out and let me know. I'm very easy to find. You can send me a DM on Instagram at Vickery and Co on Twitter at Vickery and Co or even, and this is the crazy thing. If you follow me on TikTok, I'm brave Heather. So speaking of TikTok, we are just a couple of days away from completing the my brave today challenge. It's a video challenge that I did every day in the month of December, sharing something each day that I personally felt was brave. I invited several of you, all of you, and several of my friends to do this challenge along with me, and many of you have taken it and run with it. Thank you for helping me do this, for sharing your brave today. It's been so much fun to watch your journey. It's been a fun and difficult challenge, and I don't love video. For those of you who know that, that's actually one of the reasons I allowed myself, pushed myself into this daily video challenge, and it's especially why I did it on TikTok forced me to get to know the platform a little better. I am still no expert. My 12 year old has been trying to teach me, (laughs) Woo! but the videos have been fun. I've learned a lot about myself. I've learned a lot about my brave and what I want to share and how I want to connect with all of you on it. So go over to TikTok, follow me. I'm at brave Heather on TikTok. Let's be friends there. Get to know each other a little bit better. I'm having some fun over there and I'm playing nothing fancy. Uh, But we could have a good time. And then you can see all of my videos from the My Brave Today Challenge. All right, folks, today we are talking about creating our own lives, designing our own successes, and mastering our mindsets to get what we want out of life. That's right. You heard me. You can master your own mindset to get what you want out of life. I met today's guest last August, and this college senior truly impressed me. Michael Boley really understands what it takes to live a happy and successful life. I know an awful lot of adults who still struggle with this concept, but Michael chose to enlighten himself at a very young age. And now, armed with the power to control his reality, little hint here, this is through controlling his mindset, Michael has overcome many obstacles to become the determined entrepreneur and podcaster that he is today. Growing up an introvert and looking at all things he was once too scared to do, 
Michael had an opportunity to break through and become something different. So he took that opportunity and he ran with it. Y'all are gonna love Michael as much as I do and be really inspired by what this generation is bringing to our world and our global community. I'm really excited to share it with you. So let's get to know Michael. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Friends, I don't often meet really young people who have already learned to, I don't know, let's call them business moguls, who've already learned to be business moguls. But today's guest, I kind of think, has done that. And I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Michael Boley at a podcasting conference. And this very confident, self-assured young man came up and introduced himself to me, still in college, and he kind of shyly said, oh, I have this podcast and I do this business and we're going to learn all about it. And I said, you're here, man. You got to own this. You got to stand up. Like you get to take up space just because you're young doesn't mean you're any less worthy than anyone else. But Michael's a really cool guy. And I love it because his sort of, is it your mantra, Michael? You'll have to tell me if you learn to control your perception, you control your own reality. Is that your mantra? What is that? Yes, that's like my core message that I live by. I love that. So normally I would be like, Michael, hi, welcome to the show, which I'm going to say. And he's like, wait, you really want me to talk right now? It's podcaster (laughs) to podcaster, right? We throw them off every once in a while. Listen, if you're anything like me, listener, you're already wondering, how did this kid get here? Because it's pretty advanced, even for a seasoned adult. So I'm excited to talk to Michael about it. Welcome to the Brave Files. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me, Heather. I'm super excited for this. (laughs) I'm really looking forward to it also. I was so impressed with you when we met last summer because you're kind of this interesting mix of still a little quiet and shy. I don't know what you're you're like in your real life, but my perception, a little quiet and shy, but also you know what you want and you know how to go after it and you have something really valuable to share with the world talk to me about that. Yeah, yeah. So I think that actually comes from at the the heart, I am an introvert. And I think it comes from, you know, being growing up as an introvert and a pretty shy kid, but just within me also having this kind of determination to just not live a limited life and not let my introvertedness limit me because I I've always had some sort of a a curiosity about what's possible for me in life and so regardless of uh, or despite having a lot of introversion and and shyness when I was young I just knew that the only way forward if I really wanted to live a full fulfilling life where I didn't hold back was to just go out and get uncomfortable and try stuff I mean Yeah, that's but I work with, you know, 40 and 50 year old professional adults who are struggling to do that uncomfortable thing. What do you think it is about you that makes you able to do that? And I want to dig in on the the introvert part, too, because that's really fascinating Mm -hmm. to me as well. I mean, I think it. Most of us know that that what we really want is is on the other side of uncomfortable, and we've got to do it. How does that become crystal clear to a really young kid? And at what age, really? Because you're still kind of a young kid, <laughs> right? You're a senior. You senior in college or junior? Yeah, senior in college, twenty two. Okay, twenty two. I mean, you're a man, but you're a young man, right? Like, mm-hmm. so at what point in your life were you like, no, Michael, you're not going to just sit around and be a wallflower. You're going <laughs> to go out and do uncomfortable things. Like, how old were you when you, when you decided to do that? Well, I think it was it was part of me from an early age. I think part of what I attribute it to is growing up with pretty pretty old parents. Like I was the last child of 
uh, what would have been mini child. My dad had a previous marriage. And so I have an older brother that's technically in his like fifties. It's pretty oh, crazy. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but that's, that's like, like a, a half brother. But I mean, I, I came at the end at the very, very end. And I think having older parents growing up that uh, just made me more mature in, in some way. And I think that that did play a role in it. Um, and just just back to you know the idea of of how I or when was that point? I, I don't I think when it really happened was in when I made my first step outside of my box, like my first big step outside of my box, and realized that it wasn't so bad to fail at something. And mm. I was like, I I can I can live with this. I can move on. What if I try this other thing? How and old were you? Do you remember? I was, yeah, I was, this was in high school probably when I, okay. I first tried. Uh, I went from introvert to going out and auditioning for theater and for musical theater when I didn't know how to sing. So Good for you. Uh, I have a musical theater <laughs> degree, so I'm a really? fan. I awesome. didn't know we had that in common. <laughs> yeah, no, and I loved it. I loved it. But I, I mean, that, that must have been when I was about 16. Yeah, I was 16. That's cool. Now, these are the kinds of things I've, I mean, I guess some people just, they figure it out internally, but were you seeing this modeled with your parents or with your older siblings, this put stuff out there, risk, try, fail, you got to try new things? You know, I think it was almost a little bit of the opposite, Mm. where I learned what not to do in enemy cases, and Mm. um, I learned that if I didn't, choose what I wanted to do if I didn't take control about what I wanted to do that other people would choose for me and I didn't want that yes that's my favorite concept that's my favorite realization in the whole world is if you don't drive your own bus if you don't create your own truth somebody else will do it for you That's right. That's right. Because everybody else has their own agenda Mm -hmm. and what they would like to see happen. And the only one that's in the driver's seat for, you know, what you want to make happen is at the end of the day, just your decision. Mm, I love that. So what changed for you once you decided to get involved in theater, which was a thing? And actually, before you answer that, what made you pick theater? If you had no experience, what (laughs) made you decide on that? Yeah, so I was actually roped into it. I had a buddy of <laughs> mine that, you know, he was more outgoing, he was more confident, he was more popular, and he was like, I'm gonna do this thing. I'm gonna go audition. And I was like, I was like, I, I like thought about it for a while. I was like, man, like that's that's kind of cool. Like he's gonna go audition and like try this thing that he's never done before. And I was like, well, what if I could do that? And I was like, you know what? Like I'll, I'll go to the audition with you. Like I I wasn't fully committed. I was like, I'll go and see, (laughs) you know, I'll scope it out. Right. Like there's nothing wrong with that. So I'll go scope it out and I can always like leave, you know, I can always just Mm -hmm. do whatever. And the day comes for the audition and I show up and he's not there. My buddy just (laughs) totally decided (laughs) that he didn't want to do it. Not cool, man. (laughs) But I was still there, and uh, and I was just like, "All right, I mean, I'm here. Like, it's almost the 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 path of least resistance just to just to check it out and and stay here." So I did, and I mean, I don't know. I mean, you've probably been through right auditions like this, and once they start. It's like you don't get out. Yeah. Yeah. You don't. You don't get out. <laughs> like you you're stuck once it starts. And I was like, so there, there's a part of me in that moment when it started where I was like, I was like, oh, oh, crap. Like this. This is this is real. I can't get out of this. And it's pretty much I have two decisions. I either I either look really awkward, like I'm not trying. Like I, I, I just give up in the moment and do nothing or which is even worse, or I just go full out, <laughs> yeah. you know? Because like, like in that moment when everybody is like being, you know, they're doing the warm ups or something, everybody's being wacky or crazy. Like it's it's even worse to just do nothing. So I was like, <laughs> all is. right, I'm just gonna like <laughs> go for it because like yeah. that seems like the best case scenario. And so I did, and um, 
and it really it it it, it, it unlocked a different part of myself mm-hmm. I didn't know was possible then. I love that. And you know, the more folks read and and study or watch interviews with, the more we realize that an awful lot of entertainers and performers are very very shy, are absolute mm-hmm. introverts, and that this is a way of expressing or of of you know, trying things or putting yourself out there that almost feels safe, maybe because you're playing a part or, I don't know, everyone else is being silly, so it doesn't feel as much of a a big risk. I love that. Let's talk. So I have a a brand new, just released sister podcast called, was it Chance, that I started with somebody else that I met at the same podcasting conference I I met you at. His name is Alan Seals. And in our very first episode, he asked me, if I thought introverts were at a disadvantage. So the, the concept of, the, of that show is, um, do we manifest our truths? Do we, you know, what happens when we look for opportunity and we take advantage of it and we step into it? Or, you know, are we going to miss it? That kind of thing. And he asked me if I thought introverts were at a disadvantage for putting themselves out there to find opportunity to create chance. And I'd love to hear your answer to that question. I think that introverts actually have a bigger opportunity in many ways. And here's why. I I think that growing up as an introvert and looking at all the things that, you know, I was too scared to do in the moment, introverts have the opportunity to make that breakthrough and discover something like a, a new side of themselves or, or they have the opportunity to break through and be something different, whereas extroverts oftentimes take that for granted. And so mm. I think the introvert that can make that breakthrough and be intentional about using it is much more powerful and maybe even a much bigger opportunity than starting off as an extrovert. That's cool. I like that perspective. I also told him that I did not think it was a disadvantage, but I do think it's a different advantage. Um, So yeah, that's cool. Thank you for sharing that with me. So share for listeners and give me some more background on, you you got into theater, you started to come out of your shell a little bit and get curious. You, You mentioned earlier, you've always been a curious person. And I love that word. You've used it in your three words, curiosity. Um, it makes me think when my kids were really little, they all loved Curious George. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I loved Curious George because it's like, I'm going to get into trouble, but also great things are going to happen when I choose to go, go out and get into trouble. And we're not talking about, you know, illegal stuff, but, you know, putting yourself out there and finding out what happened for you when you went off to college. Yeah. So once I was out of college and, you know, when you're a senior in college or a senior in, in high school i mean you're like at the top of the game right you think oh you yeah are big fish shit. little and, pot. yeah <laughs> <laughs> and so i was like yep life is life is good life is easy i'm going to um ended up going to oregon state so in state school far enough away from my parents to have a life but close enough that i could drive home if i wanted to nice. um and I so did the same thing <laughs> yeah Yeah, and so I went to college. I was actually really excited to live with my best friend at the time. We had been had been friends since uh, middle school, and we're super close. We didn't go to the same high school together, but we still hung out like every weekend. Like we were tight, and um, and we were just super excited about dorming together the first year, and we did, and it was awesome for like one quarter. Okay. <laughs> for like one quarter. Um, and, you know, kind of girl next door caught his interest, started spending a lot of time. We had a pretty big falling out, uh, even though I had convinced him to join the same fraternity as I did. So now he was like in the fraternity, but we weren't friends. And it was just a whole, a whole ordeal that kind of broke me a little bit because, or maybe a lot of it, because he had been such a such a strong part of what I'd consider to be a, a childhood best friend growing up. Hmm. And I was almost pretty desperate to reclaim that friendship and that relationship because I I don't like being unsettled in 
any relationship, especially what, what should be my closest ones. Um, and so I had to figure out, I had to figure out a little bit more about who I was and what I, what I was about. And I, I had to come to terms with, you know, I, I was open to reconnecting, but I was just kind of waiting for that opportunity for, for him to feel the same way, um, after we had the falling out. And so I, I don't, I just, I feel like there was a space in me that was, was kind of left open that I needed to, Hmm. you know, fill with something. And I think that something, I mean, I I had my own relationship. I still have my own relationship at the time that was part of that. But I think a large part of that was just getting more determined and filling it with a lot of goals that I wanted to achieve. And part of that was, um, after that first year of college, finding a sales gig and what, why though what makes a freshman in college or a rising sophomore in college think i'm gonna go get a sales job yeah it's not so like a, random. i'm not gonna like work at starbucks <laughs> or you know air pastel or whatever like yeah honestly i think i had a little bit of i don't i don't i don't think i had read like rich dad poor dad at the time but i i just wanted something that would be different something that wouldn't be like a normal uh like a normal nine to five that i had more control over my schedule and that's what uh that's what this offered it offered quite a big opportunity much a much bigger income opportunity and more control over my schedule and my time and so i honestly i had no clue what i was doing when i started i had absolutely i was i was like i'm not i'm not built for this i I don't know what's going on uh you know, making, making calls to people that I didn't know was cold calling was not something I was comfortable with. Um, all this stuff was like brand new. And I, I almost, I almost dropped it. I almost dropped it. Um, what I, this was probably next to losing my, my best friend. One of the most challenging parts of my life was having to uh, go in home doing sales presentations um, not door to door, but setting up cold calls and then going in and, and doing a demonstration and getting rejected in person mm-hmm. and having people say no. And <laughs> that then is an dr- <laughs> on the job training right there. That's life training 101. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and then and then driving across town right to the next appointment and having like another no. And uh, that that was really, really tough for me and that this was probably next to um the performing arts uh one of the the biggest breakthroughs that i had in my journey was deciding that i was actually going to stick with it even Mm. though it was really scary to continue getting no's and i would i would just it would take me you know days weeks or sometimes like a month to build up the courage to go and do it again it hurt like I was not used to being judged by random people. That was really tough. So um, I, I stuck. Why did I, you I decided, stick with it? Why? Yeah. <laughs> because and, I, and I'm not I'm not trying to be an asshole when I say this. I'm really not. But I remember being that age. And most people that age are going to say, this is too hard. Pass. Like, no mm-hmm. thanks. I, including me at that age. And I certainly think my my, my kids would, I hate to say that, but so why, why do you stick with it? You know, I think it had to do with something that my manager said or something that was said pretty often. And it, it was, it was that you could go and find another opportunity. You could go, you know, work at Starbucks or work at something else, but you, you'll still have your main problem stick with you. Mm. And the problem is that you'll still be there in whatever you do. And if you if you can't get past this fear or this the, the fear of being judged, then you are going to bring that with you to your next job. You're going to bring that. that with you no matter where you go. And so I saw it as an opportunity to learn how to deal with something that if I didn't learn how to deal with would hold me back for the rest of my life. So I said, I'm going to learn how to deal with this right now. I love that. That whole concept of you can 
continue to chase this thing, but your problem is always going to stay with you because it's yours. It's you're not yeah. dealing with the underlying issue or you can face it and work through it. And would you say now that sales is easy for you? Like, have you gotten to the point where you're like, eh, rejection, who cares? No problem. I love it. <laughs> or is it still challenging, but it just doesn't take you out for as long? Like, what? Do you, how do you feel about it now? So now it, I, I have to say it is significantly better, but I mean, I think it's in human nature to want to be liked and accepted. And so yeah, for sure. like it, it doesn't go, it doesn't go away completely, but it does get significantly better. And that's, that confidence, the confidence that comes with being okay with somebody rejecting you and at least being able to like deal with it and move on pretty quickly. Like that's something that I've been able to translate into pretty much everything else that I've done, uh, where I had to step out there, um, in terms of also giving like sales pitches and, um, not, not in sales, but in, um, in like accelerator programs, entrepreneurship programs in through my university, doing that kind of stuff, pitching to investors. Um, I, I still, I still feel a sting. It's just that I've, I've understood how to move through it with a lot better ease because I see the rejection differently and I don't take it personally. Hmm. That's a really important takeaway is it's not you that's being rejected. They're not into the, they're not into the product or the project or the service or whatever it is. They just don't want the thing you're selling. It doesn't mean they don't value you or that you aren't important. I really appreciate that. What were you selling? Knives and cutlery and kitchen stuff. Fucking A, man. That's a hard job. Yeah. <laughs> you were selling knives door to door. Wow. You really like went for the hard stuff. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> that is like I, I was challenge. convinced. <laughs> <laughs> I was determined. I was like, we're going to, we're going to make this happen because the thing is like with that kind of job, you can imagine recruiting, um, and having mainly a, a lot of young people in that job, like the, the turnover, the churn is ridiculous. And so I would, I would be in the office watching pretty much everybody that I initially started with in the office isn't there anymore and more people are coming through and I'm I was pretty much the only one that actually stuck with it through um for years and you were college. making and you were making money and I was making more money than I knew I could ever <laughs> could I ever could in like a normal nine to five or working at in fact I did actually work like a term or two a quarter or two at the university as a IT desk guy and I would help people with their technical difficulties in the university. And it was freaking torture. <laughs> I could not I could not handle that because I felt like I, I didn't have control over my time. I was just being paid to sit there and then take the calls and there wasn't meaning to it and I wasn't growing. And so I, I quit that pretty pretty quick and just stuck with the sales stuff. Well, and clearly you got so many more valuable life and business skills as a, I'm just, I love it as a door to door knife salesman, which is in mm -hmm. fucking incredible, Michael. And I just, I think I know the answer to this because I've been an entrepreneur for most of my adult life and both of my parents were entrepreneurs or sales, that kind of commission based only outside sales. Um, you're talking about the turnover, but you're there making a lot more money than most kids your age know what to do with what's the what's the difference like why were you there making the money is it i mean the answer is that you are you're the the one that stayed you just kept trying right i think yeah i think i i stayed i kept trying and i had this part of me some some part of high school that we hadn't talked about was uh learning about meditation and oh. um, me diving into buddhist philosophy at that point i had i think it was probably my second year in high school somebody pulled me in um, a senior that I looked up to was like, hey, you want to come to this meditation club? And I was like, you're cool. And meditation sounds okay. So wow. let's try it out. And I I got into that. And then, you know, every, every session we would meditate for about 10 minutes. And then we would read a little bit of um, some text of a Buddhist philosopher 
or a monk and it would be really eye-opening i was like this this is actually really interesting cool stuff and it got me interested in how to live a like happy fulfilling life and what does your ability to perceive things have to do with it and i got kind of really interested in that started reading on my own and um that's something i carried with me into wow sales and then um and helped me i think stay and stick with the challenge because i was like this isn't gonna this isn't gonna change i need to change i need to figure this out so oh my gosh i love that we definitely don't hear that enough i really wish that the schools taught sort of these eastern philosophies and like imagine if when a kid misbehaves if they teach them how to meditate or do yoga versus putting them in detention and sitting in a room by themselves you know like I don't Mm -hmm. know it's so cool that you did that and also such a uh, kind of a revolutionary approach to being successful in this type of outside commission-based sales job I think about all of the adults that I know in these kinds of jobs who have such old school, traditional, stoic, do it this way, it's got to be done like this approaches, and how much more successful these companies would be if if they had your philosophy. Yeah, yeah, I think, and that's one of the the reasons why I I was really interested in diving more into these topics because I was like, whoa, like this stuff, this stuff's helping, like this stuff's working. I, I, like, I feel more capable. I feel more confident. I feel better. And it, it almost became a little bit of a game. Like I kept coming back to sales and to getting rejected because I was like, all right, how am I going to figure it out this time? Or how am I going to get better at looking at it this time? And so it, it just became this game of how do I continue to see things the right way and, um, not take things personally and improve my ability to overcome challenges. Um, I just kept coming back for that. That's really, really, really cool. Do you still meditate? I do still meditate. What's your meditation practice look like? So I mainly do like a breathing meditation because that's how that's how I started. And so, mm-hmm. but I, I've I've transitioned a little bit. I always start with a breathing meditation, and so I'm just focusing on on my breath in and out and I mean we we can go into everything about meditation but um (laughs) but I've (laughs) but I've kind of transitioned a little bit into just a very a more broad awareness of Mm. not just breath but also um sensations thoughts that would come through being aware of them but not you know not holding on to them so that you get like pulled into that train of thought but just being aware of like what are the what are the image or what are the images even that are popping up in my mind and what are those thoughts what are the sensations that I feel in my body where do I feel them where are sounds coming from like just this kind of broad like meta awareness that has been really really cool for me lately after I I kind of did breathing meditation for a while as a base just to kind of understand what I was doing with meditation so do you just do it when it's when you need it it just is your sort of default behavior or do you have specific time set aside every day to do it so i have a morning routine okay and i love morning routines and so um it's part it's part of my morning routine that i'll do it and i'll also do um a little bit of like tony robbins priming um that stuff and uh, a bunch of other self-care related stuff and then pretty much my whole morning is just related uh like there's like two hours of morning routine stuff because wow. that that like keeps me grounded like that's what i that's just what keeps me going pretty much so i love i love that and i love that you're learning it now and um i i laugh you know i have four kids and the idea of having two hours to myself to do anything in the morning is hilarious but mm-hmm. i think for people who start doing this when they're young, you find a way to keep parts of it. It's going to shift, right? Because that's what oh, yeah. happens in life is that as our circumstances change um, and not necessarily better or worse, just different, our systems, our routines, our processes have to shift and adjust right along with them. But it's a really, really fantastic foundation. So you have, we met at a podcasting conference. I told everybody that at the beginning. Tell everyone about your podcast and I'm mostly curious about why well, I'm curious about all of it but what made you start it yeah so 
something interesting happened when I started to dive into um, not not Eastern philosophy and Buddhist philosophy when I started diving into Tony Robbins, who was actually recommended to me by uh, my manager, by my sales manager at the time. And then that led into a lot of other uh, books like, you know, Psycho, Psycho Cybernetics and uh, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and all sorts of stuff. And then into business, um, some connection. I, I, I made this connection between what I was learning in Buddhist philosophy and what I was learning in Western philosophy about self-improvement. And that was this idea of perception. And it goes back to my mantra or core message about if you learn to control your perception, you're able to control your reality. And this was something that was in common between those two uh, categories that I was reading about. And I really, it, I really stuck with that. And I, I think that is the core of why I've been able to do what I've done so far is being able to shift my perception in ways that brings more uh, peace and power and confidence into my life. And so what I what the podcast really started from was me getting so much out of these concepts and applying them every day and what I was doing in in my sales position and just in life and wanting to share those benefits and those concepts with a younger generation because mm -hmm. these concepts are most commonly taught at least the the western stuff to entrepreneurs and business leaders and people like that but it's not focused towards the younger generation and why i think it would be critical to focus that kind of content and information towards a younger generation is because if you can do it from the beginning, if you can get the habits in place, if you can get the mindset in place about how to control your perception, what does that mean for the rest of your life? Like, I want to get these people early. I want to influence my friends around me, people that are college age, in order to establish these core critical principles that they can live and enjoy for the rest of their life. So that's what the idea of control shift mindset came from. It was so fun to be on your show. Now, most of your guests are are also younger. I think you were a little afraid, like, this old middle-aged lady is going to come in here and not speak the language of my young people. <laughs> mm -hmm. You did, right? I think you were worried about like, it. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd brought on other, like, not college kids, and honestly, oh, I... You didn't want to call I me enjoy old. Getting... That's nice of you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was awesome. I loved having you on. But so most of your guests are are younger folks. And I am curious what your listenership and your audience engagement is like. Are you finding that your college age audience is into this? They're like, oh, yeah, let's do this. Because there's a the generation is so different and awesome. And I are you te are you technically Gen Z or are you? Gen yeah, I yeah. am technically gen z yeah i love gen z i fucking love yeah. you guys <laughs> like you are incredible as a generation it's really fascinating to watch very change oriented very social change oriented you know responsibility for yourself oriented which is not something that previous generations have really done a lot of so i think it's cool so what kind of audience engagement response do you get from other college age folks so what i found is that the people who it resonates with, it really resonates with. And they stick with it and they love it and they give me feedback uh, all the time about it. And then for other people, they're like, I'm just, I'm just not there. I just wanna like yeah. kinda chill and live my, my college life and not really, not really think about these other things. It's just, it's just not their thing. And so I just focus on the people who do love it, who are interested yeah, of in- course. It, because I mean, those are the type of people, honestly, I want to surround myself with right now. Yeah. Like I want more of those people in my life. Yes. I love that. I mean, and that's such an important lesson, like choose to be around the type of people that you want to be around, that you want to be like, that you want to live up into and grow with. That's so, so, so important. So you're a senior in college. You've already done all of these amazing things. What do you want to do after you graduate? Oh, such a great question. I want to be an entrepreneur uh, when I graduate, as I graduate, I have from the, the sales position I did, you know, 
developed kind of a runway for myself out uh, moving out of college. Um, and so my my goal is going to be I, I give myself about a year to build and and I'll, I'll use this runway because I know that that's at the end of my North Star and I don't want to uh, I don't want to settle and spend like half my days just to make money when I've saved up enough to have this runway to just freaking go for it. So that's amazing. Um, I would like to build this community stronger. Uh, the the community of, of a younger generation that's committed to self improvement, and I would also like to uh, kind of expand that into a, a bigger online business. There's there's more things that are are to come. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not quite sure if I'm ready to share now, but that's that's the direction <laughs> I'm going. All right. Very good. Well, I cannot wait to see. I, I have zero doubt that whatever it is you decide to put out there, you will thrive at. Um, it's yeah, it's cool. I think you're really fun. You're a fun one to watch. Keep your eyes out for Michael Boley, folks. Michael, how do you celebrate success? That's a great question. So I celebrate success. Honestly, for me, success is all about people. And so mm. I celebrate success by giving thanks and spending time with the people who I created that success with. I am not naive enough to think that even in the sales stuff that I created that success by myself, I didn't. I had my manager behind my back the whole time. I had my friends and family supporting me. So I believe that you know, true success isn't really about what gets accomplished, but it's more about the relationships that we develop along the way. And so sharing that feeling of accomplishment with other people is just one of my favorite things to do. I love that. I love it. And it builds connection and community and momentum and inspiration and all of all of the different branches that come off of that. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, you and I could keep talking for a really long time, but it is time to ask the last couple of questions uh, that are always consistent in the show. You asked me at the beginning, I'm like, is, the, is it really scripted? And I'm like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. But <laughs> I do always ask and I love this question. It feels really important to me is what is your favorite charitable organization to support? So my favorite one to support is actually UNICEF. And that's because my, my girlfriend and I, she's, she's actually really involved in um, international relations and policy and um, very humanitarian perspective. And um, we, we, I mean, she's also she's also uh, native Lebanese, um, 100% Lebanese, and um, have seen quite just quite the things going on around the world. And I believe that if, if you want to change the world, you have to start, I think, with the people that are coming into the world next, and that's the younger generations. And so mm -hmm. UNICEF is focused towards um, all around the world as a children's fund to support children, and I that's that's what I am passionate about supporting. It's awesome. Thank you for sharing that. They'll be our charity of the week. We'll have links to them on the show notes. And as always, listeners, go get to know them a little bit better. If you have something to give, time, money, shares, whatever it is, go out and do that. Michael, will you share your three words with us one last time? Yes. My three words are determination, curiosity, and perception. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Those three words are perfect for you. I find... Uh, that you fit them beautifully. And I particularly love, again, this this word, this curiosity, and that it drives you. And you're, you're mostly curious about how you can manage yourself, how you can get what you want by controlling and managing how you behave, react, engage, try. It's really beautiful. I, I'm just really honored to be in your circle and... Thank you so much, Michael, for being here and, and sharing your story with us. Thank you, Heather. This has been awesome. All right, listeners, I want to know, how are you controlling your reality by shifting your own perception? You can let me know by emailing me at heather at vickeryandco.com. Send me a DM on Twitter or on Instagram. I promise that I will personally respond to each and every message that you send because I loved this. I hope you're as inspired by Michael as I am, folks. I know people who are well into their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s who haven't done what this inspiring young man has done, and I hope you're going to lean into it because the possibilities are limitless. 
This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and every day to go out and choose bravely. Bye. Hey, friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash LibroFM. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book and the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author, and it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash librofm. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery & Co. Success Coaching. Coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.